Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ here in Madison, Wisconsin. We want to welcome you back tonight to our study of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And tonight we are back to our fairly new study of the book of Numbers. And so we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Numbers chapter 5. Numbers chapter 5 will be there in just a few moments. As always, if you have any questions or co uh, comments or concerns about tonight's class, if you have anything that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274. But as I said, tonight we are back to the book of Numbers, and tonight we hope to take a look at Numbers chapters 5 through 9. And with our trip to Hawaii for my mother-in-law's memorial service, we've taken a break from Numbers for a few weeks. And I hope that all of you were able to find the links that we sent out to Melvin Ote's three lessons on maintaining unity when we disagree. If you have not had a chance to view those, you can search on Vimeo and find those rather easily. But let me know if you need any help finding those lessons, and I'd be glad to send you those links. I really appreciate Brother Melvin, and I hope that you were uh, able to benefit from those lessons just as I was. But tonight we are back to numbers, and as we learned when we first started numbers a few weeks ago, what we might expect to find in the book of numbers is a bunch of numbers. Numbers. And yes, uh, the book of Numbers is basically a record of the census that was taken at the beginning of their time in the wilderness. And then we have another census at the end of their time in the wilderness, right before they cross over into the promised land. So that's how it gets its name. And it seems that the point of the census is to number the military aged men, those from 20 years old and upward who were able to fight. And the census would also allow the people to get more organized by tribe. And so we have a, a list of the 12 tribes, uh, not the 12 sons of Israel, as we might expect, but the modified list where the Levites are not included, since they are not to fight, they are the priest. And then this also is a list where Joseph is not included, but his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, take his place, effectively giving Joseph's descendants a double portion of that inheritance, and he was, in fact, a favorite son. Well, as we learn, the total of the men 20 and older was 630. 3,550, indicating that the grand total, everybody included, was perhaps somewhere between two to three million people. So that'd be a group very roughly the same size as the entire city of Chicago. Well, the book of Numbers also explains why the people didn't go straight from Egypt to the Promised Land, doesn't it? And this book is going to explain why that trip took 40 years instead of just a few weeks. We'll get there. But this was due to their lack of faith and their rebellion, and Paul certainly uses this as a warning to us not to rebel, not to complain and whine just as they did over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So tonight we have something of a variety pack. There's not one unified theme, but these chapters we're kind of putting together uh, because of the miscellaneous nature of what's in here. So let's take a look tonight at chapters 5 through 9. And let's jump right into it tonight with Numbers chapter 5, where God emphasizes the importance of purity in the camp. And we won't read every verse in this chapter, but let's at least start with Numbers 5, verses 1 through 4. Numbers chapter 5, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the sons of Israel that they send away from the camp every leper and everyone having a discharge and everyone who is unclean because of a dead person. You shall send away both male and female. You shall send them outside the camp so that they will not defile their camp where I dwell in their midst. The sons of Israel did so and sent them outside the camp, just as the Lord had spoken to Moses, thus the sons of Israel did. Here at the beginning tonight, we have just the uh, reminder that those who are unclean are to be sent away from the camp. I think earlier we learned about this in theory, we might say. That is, when the law was first given, we saw the uh, law come from the Lord. But this seems to be where it actually starts. In other words, right now... Those who are unclean in the camp need to leave. They need to remove the unclean from the camp. And this is exactly what they do. So they execute the law. They do what the law requires. And so in verse 4, the people actually remove those who are unclean from the camp, uh, just as they were instructed to do. Well, as we continue into the next paragraph, we find that God is concerned not only with physical uncleanness, as in disease and leprosy and various discharges and all of that, 
But the Lord is also concerned with moral uncleanness, as with sin. So it's not just the outside of the cup, it is also the inside of the cup. A reference to that uh, illustration that Jesus uses in the Gospel account. So let's notice Numbers 5, verses 5 through 10. Numbers 5, verses 5 through 10. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel. When a man or woman commits any of the sins of mankind, acting unfaithfully against the Lord, and that person is guilty, then he shall confess his sins which he has committed, and he shall make restitution in full for his wrong, and add to it one-fifth of it, and give it to him whom he has wronged. But if the man has no relative to whom restitution may be made for the wrong, the restitution which is made for the wrong must go to the Lord for the priest, besides the ram of atonement by which atonement is made for him. Also, every contribution pertaining to all the holy gifts of the sons of Israel, which they offer to the priest, shall be his. So every man's holy gifts shall be his. Whatever any man gives to the priest, it becomes his. So again, it's not just the leprosy and those outward things that bother the Lord, but he's also concerned about people lying and cheating and stealing against one another. And so we have the reminder in this paragraph, if you sin against somebody, you have to first of all confess. In other words, you've got to admit it. I think the word confess, going back to Latin, actually is uh, the idea of saying the same thing as somebody. And so God says this is a sin, and when we confess, we're saying, yes, I agree. It is a sin, and I did it. I'm guilty of it. So they have to confess. And then notice, secondly, going back to the law of Moses given earlier, they have to make restitution plus one-fifth. So they have to pay back what they have taken and then add one-fifth to that as well. All right, in the rest of Numbers chapter 5, we have what we might describe as an adultery test. Uh, this is a, a rather unusual paragraph. We're not going to take the time to read the entirety of the rest of this chapter. But basically, if a man suspects his wife of committing adultery, and if there are no witnesses, the husband is to take his wife to the priest along with a sacrifice. He is to let the priest handle it. And basically, the priest is to offer the sacrifice, the wife is to drink some special water, and if she is guilty, she will waste away and be cursed, never bearing children again. But if she's innocent, the water of that curse will have no effect and she'll be fine. And that's just my paraphrase, I guess, of the second half of this chapter. And it, it really seems strange, doesn't it? I mean, especially to us in modern times, but I would just make sure we think about the alternative Back in 1400 BC, in the middle of the wilderness, back in those times, you know if a husband gets jealous, even if it's for no reason, can we picture how that might go down back then? I mean, he very well may abuse or even kill his wife and just start over, just kind of make her disappear in the wilderness. Jealous husbands have been known to do that, of course, through time. However, I just want us to notice that under God's law, there is a process slow down, let the priest handle it, and then God will render a judgment through the priest. And certainly this protects the innocent, but it also preserves the purity of the people, if in fact the woman is guilty of what she's been accused of doing. If you have any thoughts on this, I would love to hear from you. Some have suggested that this was psychosomatic, and I'm not sure whether that is the uh, best word for this, but some have suggested that by taking this uh, in a public way and, and having the woman stand out there in front of the priest and having her drink some special curse water, uh, that if she was guilty, she would simply get so scared believing the water was real that she would kind of out herself in that immorality and that if she was innocent, she wouldn't get that nervous. You know, that's a theory here. I don't think that's it. I think God is involved here, and I think Moses explains that he is. Uh, but in my mind, the main benefit here, as I said before, is slowing the process down and protecting the woman from an unjustly jealous husband while simultaneously keeping the people pure in that process. But again, let me know uh, what you think of this. Again, we're not going to read all of the uh, gruesome details there. Feel free to dig into that on your own. Well, over in the next chapter, number six, we get to what is known as the Nazarite vow. And we'll break this into two sections, starting with number six, verses one through twelve. Number six, one through twelve. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite, to dedicate himself to the Lord, he shall abstain from wine and strong drink, 
He shall drink no vinegar, whether made from wine or strong drink, nor shall he drink any grape juice, nor eat fresh or dried grapes. All the days of his separation he shall not eat anything that is produced by the grapevine, from the seeds even to the skin. All the days of his vow of separation no razor shall pass over his head. He shall be holy until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to the Lord. He shall let the locks of hair on his head grow long. All the days of his separation to the Lord he shall not go near to a dead person. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister when they die, because his separation to God is on his head. All the days of his separation he is holy to the Lord. But if a man dies very suddenly beside him and he defiles his dedicated head of hair, then he shall shave his head on the day when he becomes clean, he shall shave it on the seventh day. Then on the eighth day he shall bring two turtle doves or two pigeons to the priest to the doorway of the tent of meeting. The priest shall offer one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering and make atonement for him concerning his sin because of the dead person. And that same day he shall consecrate his head and shall dedicate to the Lord his days as a Nazarite and shall bring a male lamb a year old for a guilt offering. But the former days will be void because his separation was defiled. Well, I know it's a lot there, but what we're dealing with here is some kind of a special vow. So this is not required. This is not something everybody has to do. But as I understand this, if somebody wants to go above and beyond in their dedication to God, if they really want to get close to the Lord, maybe in a way that they hadn't before, this is how to do it. And notice first on the list is no wine or strong drink. In fact, someone who takes this vow cannot even eat a grape, not fresh, not even a raisin. You can't touch raisins. And again, this is above and beyond. And, you know, if you'd like something to think about, I, you know, I would encourage you to ask yourself, what about wine and strong drink and raisins for those who do not take this vow? I mean, obviously, this is above and beyond. Well, the second requirement is that a person taking this vow must not cut his hair, but he is to allow his hair to grow long. I think some of my uh, friends and loved ones perhaps have taken the Nazarite vow without my knowledge, but uh, they were not allowed to cut their hair. And then thirdly, notice a person taking this vow is also not to go near a dead body. And note, I believe the prohibition for everybody is not to touch a dead body, but for a person taking this vow, they are not even to go near a dead body. And the other thing here is that there is no exception for close relatives. If you remember, we learned earlier that normal people could handle their dead relatives, with the exception of the high priest who could not go near any dead bodies for any reason, even though those of his own family. And so as I understand it, the person taking this vow is basically matching the requirement of the high priest in this regard. They are kind of being super duper extra holy, above and beyond. And so the vow does explain, however, what to do if somebody dies suddenly in your presence. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. Uh, sometimes it happens, I suppose, without planning for it. You could be next to somebody who drops dead and touches you on the way down. And uh, God certainly has an allowance for that. You didn't intend to, but the dead guy kind of touched you in a sense. Um, and there's something else that really surprised me today, and I don't know whether I'd ever really thought about it before, or if I just kind of read over this verse without thinking through it. But did you notice that the Nazarite vow is open to both men and women? I guess I had assumed that this was only something that the men could do, but the Lord very clearly says in this passage that this is an option for both men and women, doesn't he, up in verse 2. And, and again, that was surprising to me. I did not realize that. And if I have the privilege of teaching this passage 20 years from now, that may surprise me again. Um, I don't know, but I just thought that was interesting tonight. I always thought about the Nazarite vow as being taken by men, uh, but it can be taken by both men and women. Well, this vow is not permanent, so let's notice how to complete the process. So the rest of it comes to us in number 6, 13 through 21. Notice how to wrap this up, uh, how to kind of finish this vow. Number 6, 13 through 21. Now this is the law of the Nazarite when the days of his separation are fulfilled. He shall bring the offering to the doorway of the tent of meeting. He shall present his offering to the Lord, one male lamb a year old without defect for a burnt offering, and one ewe lamb a year old without defect for a sin offering, and one ram without defect for a peace offering, 
and a basket of unleavened cakes of fine flour mixed with oil and unleavened wafers spread with oil along with their grain offering and their drink offering. Then the priest shall present them before the Lord and shall offer his sin offering and his burnt offering. He shall also offer the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord together with the basket of unleavened cakes. The priest shall likewise offer its grain offering and its drink offering. The Nazarite shall then shave his dedicated head of hair at the doorway of the tent of meeting and take the dedicated hair of his head and put it on the fire which is under the sacrifice of peace offerings. The priest shall take the ram's shoulder when it has been boiled and one unleavened cake out of the basket and one unleavened wafer and shall put them on the hands of the Nazarite after he has shaved his dedicated hair. Then the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. It is holy for the priests, together with the breast offered by waving and the thigh offered by lifting up, and afterward the Nazarite may drink wine. This is the law of the Nazarite who vows his offering to the Lord according to his separation, in addition to what else he can afford according to his vow which he takes. So he shall do according to the law of his separation." So at the end of this voluntary vow, this person is to make a special sacrifice, isn't he? And not just one sacrifice, but several. This again is above and beyond all of the normal sacrifices that this man or woman would have to make in the course of a year. So this is a huge financial commitment, isn't it? And then notice in this process, he is to shave his head and he is then to offer his hair as a burnt offering on the altar. And uh, have you guys ever smelled burned hair? That is a memorable smell and uh, not always the best of circumstances when hair starts burning. I'm sure we all have some stories about this. Uh, but he has to offer his hair on the altar as a burnt offering and then he can go back to drinking wine and so on. So this is the Nazarite vow. So the question is, do we know anybody who actually took this vow in scripture? Can you think of anybody in scripture who actually took the Nazarite vow? I, I can think of at least three. There could be others. And interestingly to me, I believe all three of these pretty much had this vow taken before the, for them on their behalf before they were born. And that right there is a little bit strange, isn't it? Uh, I'm thinking of Samson, the judge. Uh, I'm thinking of Samuel, the prophet. And I'm also thinking about John the Baptist over in the New Testament. Beyond these three, some have suggested that Paul took the vow due to the reference in Acts 21, where Paul fulfilled the vow by shaving his head. Uh, however, we really don't have enough information on that, I don't think, really to come to a firm conclusion. You can think, well, it seems to have perhaps been the Nazarite vow, but beyond that, I think we better kind of stop there and just say kind of maybe. It's not really nailed down for us. Um, years ago, I remember <laughs> getting a really tight flat top. And um, when I got to our Bible study on Wednesday night, it was kind of uh, shocking, I guess. And one of our elderly members said, what? Have you taken a vow? And uh, that right there is what she was referring to. And although we're not under the law of Moses today, I think there is at least a value to learning about the Nazarite vow. Uh, not that we need to be doing this, um, uh, but it does have a way of popping up in Scripture from time to time, doesn't it? And I, I think there's a value certainly to learning what's behind it. You know, we could read about Samson and this Nazarite vow and think, okay, that's interesting without knowing the background. But knowing the background, I think, would deepen our understanding of that whole story. And the same goes for Samuel um, and uh, John the, the Immerser as well under the New Covenant. Well, this now brings us to one of the most repeated blessings anywhere in the Bible. And it's actually one of the oldest inscriptions of Scripture that has ever been found. And the context is off on this. You like Nazarite vow, Nazarite vow, Nazarite vow, and then you got boom, this thing right here. So let's look at Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. Numbers 6, 22 through 27. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. 
the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel, and then I will bless them. It's almost hard to read those verses without singing them, isn't it? Well, since this is something the Lord told Moses to say to Aaron and then told Aaron to speak this to the people, this is sometimes referred to as the Aaronic blessing, the blessing of Aaron. So as priests then, Aaron and his sons, they were to regularly remind the people that they were in the process of being blessed by God. I think that's kind of the summary. That's what's going on here. They are a blessed people. You need to remember this. And they would repeat this over and over through the centuries. This was intended, therefore, to be an ongoing encouragement, an ongoing reminder. This was a way of speaking God's name publicly in a way, not in vain, but in a way that would certainly bless the people for hearing it. And as I alluded to earlier, not too long ago, I think in the 70s or 80s, uh, archaeologists actually discovered this blessing on what is now one of the oldest pieces of scripture ever found. Uh, this blessing was inscribed on a thin sheet of silver. And this piece of silver, I, I didn't look up the measurements. I've seen it a number of times. It's maybe three quarters of an inch wide by four to six inches long. And it was very thinly, I, I don't know, pounded silver. You don't really shave silver, but uh, it was very thin silver. And it was then rolled up like a tiny scroll. And it's almost like something we would do in middle school to pass a note to somebody or something like that. A, a tiny print rolled up and they found it inside an amulet, I believe, that would be worn on a necklace. Something that somebody could take with them and, and have next to their body 24-7. And they've dated this to some point in the 7th century BC. And I just want to point that out because you'll see that in the news from time to time. More research will be done on this, but this is one of the oldest uh, pieces of scripture that uh, that we actually have. Uh, Numbers chapter 7 is actually the longest chapter in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. It's pretty much a repetition of what we've already studied in Exodus 40 uh, with a little bit more detail. So it, it doesn't seem to fall in chronological order here, but, but I want us to move forward from chapter 6 into chapter 7. Uh, let's just briefly introduce it by looking at Numbers 7, 1 through 3. Numbers 7, 1 through 3. Now on the day that Moses had finished setting up the tabernacle, he anointed it and consecrated it with all its furnishings and the altar and all its utensils. He anointed them and consecrated them also. Then the leaders of Israel, the heads of their father's household, made an offering. They were the leaders of the tribes. They were the ones who were over the numbered men. When they brought their offering before the Lord, six covered carts and twelve oxen, a cart for every two of the leaders and an ox for each one. Then they presented them before the tabernacle and so on. And again, this seems to be a reference to back when the tabernacle was first blessed and kind of open for business, we might say. Uh, but here we learn that the leaders from each tribe brought some special gifts. They brought carts and oxen as well as silver plates and bowls and other offerings. So, I mean, obviously, uh, Judah and Reuben and Gad, those men are no longer on the scene. They've been dead now for quite some time. But now the new leaders of each tribe kind of got the temple or the tabernacle started and dedicated by bringing some special gifts of their own, representing these gifts coming from the various tribes. So the entire chapter is a very repetitive record of these gifts. Kind of this is what they brought, just the names are changed. And so we plan on skipping over almost all of this. So let's skip ahead to the last paragraph in this chapter. And let's just pick up with uh, Numbers chapter 7, verses 84 through 89. Numbers 7, 84 through 89. This was the dedication offering for the altar from the leaders of Israel when it was anointed. Twelve silver dishes, twelve silver, silver bowls, twelve gold pans, each silver dish weighing 130 shekels, and each bowl 70. All the silver of the utensils was 2,400 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The twelve gold pans full of incense, weighing ten shekels apiece, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. All the gold of the pans, 120 shekels. All the oxen for the burnt offering, 12 bulls. All the rams, 12. The male lambs, one year old, with their grain offering, 12. And the male goats for a sin offering, 12. And all the oxen for the sacrifice of peace offerings, bulls. All the rams, 60. The male goats, 60. The male lambs, one year old, 60. This was the dedication offering for the altar after it was anointed. 
Now when Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with him, he heard the voice speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was on the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim, so he spoke to him. So we've got this whole chapter of the details, and now Moses at the end gives a summary of all the offerings that were brought by the leaders of each of the 12 tribes. And at the end of it, we find that God speaks to Moses from above the mercy seat. All right, in Numbers chapter 8, we've got some more repetition based on what we've learned previously. So I just want to uh, give the brief outline here. Again, we're not going to read every verse in this chapter, but in verses 1 through 4, we have the lampstand being uh, installed or deployed, set up, you know, kind of lit, and, and we're on it now, and it's, it's working. In verses 5 through 22, we've got the cleansing of the Levites, preparing them to serve in the tabernacle. And one thing I don't think I've noticed before is that in verses 9 and 10, Moses is told to assemble the whole congregation of the sons of Israel, and he is to present the Levites before the Lord, and the sons of Israel shall lay their hands on the Levites. I don't remember that part of it from previously in Scripture. And, you know, we've got a number of reasons for the, uh, the laying on of hands in Scripture. You know, sometimes if you lay hands on somebody, it just means you're fighting. You're, you're hitting people. And, and we say that today. I think cops, you know, had to lay hands on somebody kind of thing. And so it's not that. In Scripture, though, sometimes for miraculous healing, we no longer have that part of it today. Sometimes they would lay hands on people to transmit the ability to perform miracles. We no longer have that today. But here we have the idea of setting these people apart for some special service. So this was the people's way of saying, you are now our priest. Remember how the, the high priest had to lay his hand on the top of the scapegoat? And he was like transmitting the sins, saying, you know, you're now the goat that's, that's hauling the sins out. I don't know if it's a similar thing, but in reverse. But the people are laying their hands on the priest. They're basically saying, you are now our priest. And I think in that regard, we still do have this today. The laying out of hands is something that we still have the ability to do. Not the miraculous part of it, not beating people up. Certainly not that one is not recommended anyway. And, uh, but the idea of appointing elders or deacons, for example, not in a miraculous sense, but in the sense that the people laid their hands on the Levites in verse 10, setting them aside for a special purpose. In verses 23 through 26, we've got the retirement age of 50 being given for the priest who were serving in the tabernacle. As we've discussed before, it was difficult, very strenuous physical work sometimes. I mean, you were directing animals, slaughtering animals, basically butchering and grilling those animals uh, day after day after day. So very physically demanding. And after the age of 50, they could assist as needed, but they were relieved from full-time priestly duties at the age of 50. So that's just Numbers chapter 8 in a nutshell. Uh, let's continue with one more chapter tonight, Numbers 9. And we've got two sections here. And we'll start with Numbers 9, 1 through 14. I hope you have that in your own Bible, but Numbers 9, 1 through 14. Thus the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai. In the first month of the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Now let the sons of Israel observe the Passover at its appointed time. On the fourteenth day of this month at twilight, you shall observe it at its appointed time. You shall observe it according to all its statutes and according to all its ordinances. So Moses told the sons of Israel to observe the Passover. They observed the Passover in the first month on the fourteenth day of the month at twilight in the wilderness of Sinai. According to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so the sons of Israel did. But there were some men who were unclean because of the dead person, so that they could not observe Passover on that day. So they came before Moses and Aaron on that day. Those men said to him, Though we are unclean because of the dead person, why are we restrained from presenting the offering of the Lord at its appointed time among the sons of Israel? Moses therefore said to them, Wait, and I will listen to what the Lord will command concerning you. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, If any one of you or of your generations becomes unclean because of a dead person, or is on a distant journey, he may, however, observe the Passover to the Lord. In the second month, on the fourteenth day at twilight, they shall observe it. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until morning, nor break a bone of it. According to all the statute of the Passover, they shall observe it. But the man who is clean and is not on a journey and yet neglects to observe the Passover, that person shall then be cut off from his people. 
for he did not present the offering of the Lord at its appointed time. That man will bear his sin. If an alien sojourns among you and observes the Passover to the Lord according to the statute of the Passover and according to its ordinance, so he shall do. You shall have one statute, both for the alien and for the native of the land. So this is now the second Passover. The first was in Egypt. This is now the first one in the wilderness. And, I, I, you know, this, there's some repetition here also. Uh, we've already got the details from the study of Exodus and Leviticus. But here we have an interesting question that I don't think is addressed previously. Some were wondering, what if it's Passover time and we happen to be unclean? And it seems to me it said something about the dead person. So not if we touch a dead person, but it seems as if there had been an incident. And so they approach Moses and basically say, wait a minute, we had to deal with this thing does that mean that we miss the Passover completely? Are we just completely out of luck? Do we miss it this year? You know, it doesn't seem very fair. And notice in response, God allows them to celebrate Passover a month later. However, they had better have a valid excuse. You can't just be sleeping in on Passover and say, well, I'll catch it next time. Uh, you know, on the makeup day a month from now, that's not how that works. Um, but if they don't have that valid excuse of being unclean or on a long journey, uh, they will actually be cut off from their people. They will be kicked out of the camp. So that's kind of an interesting exception to the rule. Well, let's close tonight by looking at the last paragraph in Numbers 9. Numbers 9, 15 through 23. Numbers 9, 15 through 23. Now on the day that the tabernacle was erected, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony, and in the evening it was like the appearance of fire over the tabernacle until morning. So it was continuously, the cloud would cover it by day, and the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud was lifted from over the tent, afterward the sons of Israel would then set out. And in the place where the cloud settled down, there the sons of Israel would camp. At the command of the Lord, the sons of Israel would set out, and at the command of the Lord, they would camp. As long as the cloud settled over the tabernacle, they remained camped. Even when the cloud lingered over the tabernacle for many days, the sons of Israel would keep the Lord's charge and not set out. If sometimes the cloud remained a few days over the tabernacle, according to the command of the Lord, they remained camped. Then according to the command of the Lord, they set out. If sometimes the cloud remained from evening until morning, when the cloud was lifted in the morning, they would move out. Or if it remained in the daytime and at night, whenever the cloud was lifted, they would set out. Whether it was two days or a month or a year that the cloud lingered over the tabernacle, staying above it, the sons of Israel remained camped and did not set out. But when it was lifted, they did set out. At the command of the Lord, they camped. And at the command of the Lord, they set out. They kept the Lord's charge according to the command of the Lord through Moses. So once again, we're reminded that God guided his people, didn't he? using the pillar of cloud by day, using the pillar of fire by night. And this cloud would uh, cover over the tabernacle. It would hover there, and it would move whenever it was time for the people to move. And here we find they would sometimes camp for many days, and sometimes they would camp in one spot for a very short time, just a night or two. But God would set the pace with the cloud. They were not to lag behind the Lord. They were not to get ahead of the Lord. But they were to follow the Lord carefully, and he was gracious by providing that leadership for them. Well, this brings us to the end of the first nine chapters in the book of Numbers. So next week, let's pick up with Numbers chapter 10. We'll cover a few chapters then, if the Lord wills. And I believe next week, we're going to look at the people actually moving out for the first time since getting the Ten Commandments. So they're going to be on the move. And I think this uh, paragraph we just studied about that cloud and pillar of fire moving is going to be very relevant when we get back to that uh, one week from tonight. As always, thank you so much for being with us tonight on a beautiful night like this. I know there are many other things that you could be doing, uh, but it's good that we set some time aside just to concentrate on the Word of God for a bit. If there's something that we need to be praying about, if there's some way we can help or encourage you as a congregation, we want you to reach out by sending an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274. And for our Four Lakes family, let's not forget we have the clothing giveaway this coming Saturday morning from 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. And I hope you can join us for that. Let me know if you have any questions or get in touch with uh, Patsy directly. 
As we close tonight, let's all go to God in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful tonight for your word, and we're thankful that your word from so long ago has been preserved for us so perfectly. We're thankful for bits and pieces preserved in tiny scrolls, and we're certainly thankful for the more complete copies that have been copied so faithfully by your people through the years. We're thankful for the translations that we have today from Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek into the English language so that those of us listening tonight can read your word for ourselves. We no longer have to trust what other people tell us about your word, but we can open it and we can look and we can study in our own language. What an amazing blessing that is. Thank you, Father, for that. Thank you, Father, for making us a part of your kingdom, your family, the church. We love you and we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen.